Well, good morning, Meadowbrook Church. How are we doing this morning? So good to see you. Special welcome to those of you who are joining us online. We are glad that you're with us as well. So in the northern border of Thailand, there's a mountain range that in English is known as the Mountain of the Sleeping Lady. And the reason they call it this is because if you look at this mountain from a certain angle, it can look like the silhouette of a woman laying down. You can kind of see what's supposed to be the head of the silhouette on the right side of the screen. And below this mountain range, there is a network of caves that run six and a half miles deep. And on July 23rd, 2018, a group of 12 young boys entered into this cave along with their soccer coach as a post-practice outing to go explore the caves. Now, it's not unusual for people to go explore these caves. If you were to go to the, the caves, you would find the mouth of the cave has a welcome center. They have maps kind of detailing what's in the caves, and they even give tours of the caves. Now, the tours typically only go a half mile deep into the caves, but on this day, July 23rd, these 12 boys, along with their coach, journeyed two and a half to three miles deep into the cave. Now, typically, these caves are closed from the month of August through October because that's monsoon season in Thailand. Heavy rains come pretty steadily and consistently, and these caves flood with water and become impassable. Well, On this day, the monsoon season came early and it started to rain heavily while these boys were in the cave. And before they could make their way out, these caves started to flood and they ended up being trapped. And the way that it was discovered that they were trapped was that they didn't come home when they were supposed to be home. And so the parents went looking for them. And when they came to these caves, they found all of their bikes lined up in the mouth of the cave. And what ensued was a global effort, people from all over the world, to come and rescue these kids. Now, because the rains had already begun and the caves had already started to flood, it was a race against time to get them out before the caves completely flooded. And their initial effort was to divert any additional water from getting into the cave, as well as to start pumping out any water they could that was already in the cave. And the conditions were terrible. I mean, it's pitch black inside. The water was murky. The visibility was low. The passageways were tight. And naturally, they called the Navy SEALs and other special forces in to come rescue these kids. But not even they could navigate their way through this network of caves. And so, through an interesting turn of events, they turned to weekend hobby cave divers to help in the rescue efforts. These two guys, a guy named John and a guy named Rick from England, were called on. Some of the best cave divers in the world who just do it as a hobby on the weekends, on the side. John is an IT consultant. Rick was a a retired firefighter. And so these two guys, for a week and a half, explored every square inch of these caves looking for these kids. And the prevailing mood over those 10 days was hopelessness. They felt helpless. They felt powerless. Some people even assumed that these kids were already dead. And then, on day 10 of the search, Rick and John popped up into an air chamber. They had a little bit of a ceiling. They just touched base with one another, took their masks off, and started to plan where they were going to go next. And as they came up out of the water, they noticed an unusual smell. Caves, when you go cave diving, are pretty neutral in smell. And as they popped up on that day, there was a pungent, poignant smell. And then they noticed that there was a flashing light in the distance from a flashlight. And they started to swim towards that light and found all 12 boys and their coach alive on a sandbar two and a half miles deep into this cave. And they said immediately there was a mixture of relief and excitement because these boys were still alive, but also at the same time fear and dread because they realized it's going to be impossible to get them out. It was a two and a half hour swim underwater to find them, a few miles in the cave. Not even the Navy SEALs, people who are highly trained rescuers, 
could make that swim, how in the world were 10, 11, and 12-year-old boys going to make that swim out? So Rick and John said, hey, we will be back, and they swam away. But as they swam away, that feeling of helplessness and powerlessness prevailed. And I wonder if you've ever found yourself in a place where you feel helpless and powerless. I wonder if you've ever found yourself in a place where it feels like you too are trapped, maybe not in a cave, but in some circumstances that you can't find your way out. Maybe you find yourself in a relationship that is toxic and abusive, and you think to yourself, the only way out of this relationship is to end it all. Or maybe you went in for a routine doctor visit and they say, hey, we have some questions, we have some concerns, we think you should get some scans. And upon hearing the results of those scans, you have learned that you have a terminal illness and there is no way for your life to continue. Or maybe you just love spending money and you love the euphoria of a new purchase and so you spend money you don't have just to buy new things, but now you're thousands and thousands, tens of thousand dollars in debt, and the weight of that debt is crushing, and you think, there is no way I can climb out of this. The Scriptures tell us that for many people in life, the feeling of helplessness and powerlessness is everyday reality. But the Scriptures also tell us it isn't a health reality or a relational reality or even a financial reality. The helplessness and powerlessness that most people feel is actually a spiritual reality. And as Paul crosses into chapter 2 of the book of Ephesians, he names that reality because he starts Ephesians 2 saying, as for you. Now, the book of Ephesians is pretty optimistic and upbeat, especially chapter 1, because Paul is naming all of these amazing things that are true about you. You're blessed, you're chosen, you're redeemed, you're loved. But when he crosses into chapter 2, it gets personal and poignant because he says, as for who? As for you. Now, typically, when we read the you's of the Bible, we read them as second person singular. Like Paul is talking to who? You? Oh, he must be talking to me individually. But typically the you's in the Bible, especially here, are second person plural, which means if Paul was writing in the south, he would say, as for y'all. If he was writing in the northeast in Philadelphia or New York, he would say, as for you guys. He's trying to universalize the human experience, showing people that helplessness and powerlessness are universal for all of humanity. And the way that he describes helplessness and powerlessness is in terms of death. Because he says, as for you, you were dead. Now, death is a sobering reality. Even for somebody who has lived a long, fulfilled, healthy, happy life, somebody who had a great career, a great family life, got to travel the world and do all of these amazing things, even when that person passes, death is sobering and sorrowful. It's hard to attend a funeral and not be faced with your own mortality thinking one day I too will be in that same position because the statistics are not in our favor. One, out of every one person, dies. You can't outrun death. You can't outwit it. You can't outsmart it. You can't beat the reaper. He wins every time. But the death that Paul is talking about here isn't so much physical death as much as it is spiritual death. Because he says, as for you, you were dead in your transgressions and sins in which you used to live. Now, the reality is that spiritual death and physical death are linked. The reason we have physical death is because of disobedience and sin in the world. But Paul here is emphasizing the spiritual side of things, and what he's saying is that spiritual death is pervasive. Because of sin in the world, death, namely spiritual death, is everywhere. And he goes on to say that it is the descriptor 
of our present time. Because he goes on to say, when you follow the ways of this world, the way of this world is marked by sin and death. And of the ruler of the kingdom of the air, the spirit who is now at this present moment at work in those who are disobedient. And again, Paul is universalizing this experience because he says in verse 3, all of us, everyone has lived among them at one time. So what Paul is saying is that while death is pervasive, we are not actually victims of this spiritual death and physical death, but in reality, we are contributors to it. We have contributed to the breakdown and the spiritual death of God's good world. And he goes on to say the source of our sin actually comes from our desire. The source of death is from desire. Verse 3, all of us lived among them at one time, gratifying the cravings of our flesh and following its desires and thoughts. Like the rest, we were by nature deserving of wrath. Now, because of what Paul's saying here, it would be easy to think that all desire is bad. Desire is just a bad thing, especially when you pair it with what Jesus says about denying yourself as you follow him. It would be easy to conclude that desire is just bad. But the truth is, you are created to desire. The truth is, you can't not desire. You are hardwired to desire, but it's when desire begins to rule your life And desire begins to be the governing reality of your life. It can be destructive and ultimately lead to death. The book of James says the exact same thing. In James chapter 1, verse 15, James writes, When desire is conceived, it gives birth to sin. And when sin is full grown, it brings on death. Desire can lead to sin, which leads to death. And the movie Willy Wonka actually illustrates this perfectly. I mean, this is what the movie is all about. If you remember the story, I'm talking about the original Willy Wonka, right? There's this guy, Willy Wonka, who owns a chocolate factory, a candy factory, and what he wants to do is invite five lucky individuals to come and experience and tour his candy factory. So what he does is he puts these golden tickets in chocolate bars and sends them all over the world. Five tickets. Any kid who buys a chocolate bar and finds a golden ticket in their chocolate bar is a winner of an invitation to tour his candy factory. And these five kids get the chance to do it. And they walk in and their eyes are just so wide because he says, you can eat anything you want in here. Like this candy factory is yours for the taking. And in that first room, the the, the German kid, right? Augusta Gloop, he sees this chocolate river. And he's like, oh, I can just put a straw on it and let me go to town. He bends down and he starts to lap lap up this liquid chocolate and he just can't get enough. He's got chocolate dripping all over his face and he falls into the river and he's swept away by it because his desire overtook him. And then there's Violet Beauregard, right? She loves to chew gum. She always is chewing a piece of gum, just chomping away. They go into this other room and there's this piece of gum that Willy Wonka says he's created to experience a five-course meal. And they're like, oh my gosh. And and she goes to grab one. He's like, I wouldn't do it. We haven't fully tested it. We don't know all the ramifications of it. But she just can't wait. She grabs the gum and she starts to chew it. She's like, oh, it's a turkey dinner. I can taste the turkey. I can taste the mashed potatoes and the gravy. And then she gets to the dessert course. And she's like, it's blueberry pie. And what happens? She blows up like a blueberry. He told her not to do it. She couldn't help herself. She did it anyway. And she had to get rolled away. He's like, I don't know how that's going to get fixed because we haven't tested it yet. And then there's Veruca Salt, who wants a golden goose now, right? The golden goose that lays the golden egg. And her dad's like, oh, we'll buy you one when we get home. And Willy Wonka's like, they're not for sale. And she jumps up onto the little scale that measures whether it's a good or a bad goose. And she's deemed to be bad and gets sucked down to the trash compactor, right? These kids all had desire, for what they saw. And what they saw, they thought was going to be the fulfillment of their desire. And so they just went after it, no holds barred. And what ended up happening is that their desire got the best of them. 
And their desire ultimately led to their downfall. What Paul is saying here is that desire, left unchecked, leads to death. Desire, desire isn't necessarily bad, but desire left unchecked leads to death. And I realize the Willy Wonka illustration, a little trivial, but I think this picture actually captures so much of what people experience. This is a picture that a friend of mine took while she was visiting Europe. She just saw this inscription on a wall and posted it on Facebook. And I remember the day I saw it, I thought to myself, this is like the human experience for so many people in just a few lines of text. It reads, lately, I have been frequenting bad houses. We're not told what those bad houses are, but they're places no respectable man would be seen. I hate myself for my weakness. My past sickens me. I tell myself I will not go even as I drive there. And I wonder who has been there before. You say to yourself, I'm never doing that again. But give it a couple of days, maybe a couple of weeks, you find that you're doing that very same thing that you thought was going to bring you fulfillment and lasting satisfaction, but the moment it's over, it only leaves you wanting more. It feels, leaves you feeling dirty inside and ultimately leads you to feel like you're in a living death. Desire, left unchecked, can lead to death. But Easter is a message of good news. And you're like, Brian, I didn't come to church this morning to be depressed. Like, where is the good news? Well, you're in luck. It's in chapter 4 because chapter 4 starts with but. It starts with but. I love that it starts with but. Because but is a contrast word. It's comparing two different things. And for all you English majors out there, maybe you notice that all of the verb tenses in verses 1 through 3, most of them were past tense verbs. You were dead. You were. That's in the past. You're not dead anymore. You used to follow the ways of this world and of the, the ruler of the kingdom of the air. You used to do that. That's not true of you anymore. Verse 3, you lived among them. You lived past tense. You were by nature deserving of wrath. These are all past tense verbs saying, even if you live in that way in the here and now, even if you find yourself climbing into a hole of death governed by your own desire, God doesn't see you that way. Paul is contrasting the way you used to live, the way that once was true about you, but it no longer is because God has intervened. God has stepped in to do something about it, and Paul tells us God's action is motivated by his love for you, but because of his great love for us. And I wonder if there's somebody here this morning who simply needs to be reminded that God loves you. Even though you've been frequenting bad houses, even though you tell yourself you will never go there, even though your past sickens you and you hate yourself, even as you drive there, God doesn't condemn you. He loves you more than you could ever know. Because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, and here's what he has done. He has made us alive with Christ, even when we were dead in transgressions. The contrast of Ephesians 2 is that you once were dead. You once were spiritually dead, but God has made you spiritually alive if desire left unchecked leads to death. God's love brings life. God's love for you and for the world brings life for all who receive it. Now, it's unfortunate when people have this lack of awareness of being spiritually dead, that they don't understand the predicament that they're in. They don't understand that they have a problem and they're just clueless to their own spiritual death. That's a completely tragic situation, but it's even more tragic when people are spiritually alive and they don't realize it because they keep living into this place of death when God's saying, no, 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 
I have made you alive. If you have decided to follow Jesus, if you've placed your confidence in him, he has brought you back to life. But yet so many of us are living in a posture of death because we're allowing our desires to rule our life. And what Paul is saying is you don't have to keep working for this. You once were stuck in sin, but you have been made new. You once had no hope, but now you have the hope of the world at your fingertips. This is great news. This is good news. This is the best news. Now, also, unfortunately, sometimes we turn the good news into good advice. Anybody here like giving advice? There's some people who are sitting next to their spouse or a sibling. They're like, yeah, that's all you do is try and give me advice. You think it's good. But hey, for those of you who love to give good advice or you think it's good, you can just keep it to yourself. We're tired of getting all of your advice. Because what we need isn't new advice. What we need is good news. Advice puts the burden on the recipient of the advice to do something about it. Good news is a declaration of something that's already been done. So let's say you have been given a diagnosis of a terminal disease. You go into the doctor. They might give you some advice to extend your life, to improve your quality of life. It might even be good advice. But if the doctor comes in and says, hey, guess what? We just read new scans. Your cancer is gone. It was there two weeks ago. It is now gone. We don't know where it went, but it is not there. That's news. That's nothing that you have done to produce that result. It's just been done. You are going to jump and skip and run out of that hospital. You'll kiss the doctor and every nurse on the way because you have just been given your life back. That is news, not advice, but news. What Paul is saying is that we need good news. And the gospel is the best news ever, that you are spiritually dead. But because of his great love for God, who is rich in mercy, has made you alive with Christ. And what Paul does next is he describes this news in terms of grace. He says this, for it is by grace you have been saved. It is by grace, not your effort, not anybody's good advice. It is by grace you have been saved. And God raised us up with Christ and seated us in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus in order that in the coming age he might show the incomparable riches of his grace expressed in his kindness to us in Christ Jesus. For it is by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not from yourselves. It is a gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. See, what Paul is saying is that what's true of Jesus is true of you. Jesus has been made alive. Jesus was dead, but because of God's power at work in him, he brought him back to life. That's true of you. You are spiritually dead, but God has brought you back to life. The same power that raised Jesus from the dead, Paul will say in Ephesians 1, is also available to you. You have that power, that resurrection power pumping through your blood pumping through your veins. You have been made alive. But you do have a part to play. Even though it's been done for you, it's been secured for you, you do have a part to play. Your part is to believe it, is to have faith in it. Now, sometimes we think faith is intellectual agreement. That, oh yeah, I've heard this story, I agree with this story, so therefore I believe it. But Paul doesn't write about faith as intellectual agreement. That's part of it. But he writes about faith more as an act of surrender. Letting go of control of your life, your circumstances, your situation, to put your life in the hands of God. To recognize that you actually don't have as much control as you like to think you have. You receive this new life through faith, which is surrender. So go back to the cave. Right, Rick and John pop up into this air chamber. They see these 12 boys in their coach on a sandbar. They say to them, we will be back, and they swim away, having no idea how they're going to rescue them. There's no amount of effort that these kids can put into learning how to swim and dive. Two and a half hours, by the way. It took them two and a half hours swimming through these caves to find these kids. A total five-hour round trip. There's no way that they're going to learn, teach these kids how to swim and dive two and a half hours in a matter of a day. There's no amount of effort they can put it into. So as they're swimming out, thinking about what in the world are we going to do, 
Rick, who uh, is the guy on the right, the retired firefighter, he has this friend who's in Australia, a guy named Richard Harris, Dr. Richard Harris, who is an anesthesiologist. They get out of the cave that day. Rick calls Richard and he said, okay, you know our situation. You know we're looking for these kids. We have found them, which is great news, but we have no idea how we're going to get them out. Dr. Harris is also an experienced cave diver. He understands the circumstances intimately of what they're up against. And so Rick says to Richard, as an anesthesiologist, what do you think about anesthetizing these kids, sedating them, and then swimming them out while they're unconscious? And he says, that is a terrible idea. <laughs> he says, I can think of a hundred ways right off the bat for how that could go wrong. And Rick responds to him, but what if it's the only idea? What if there is no other way? They convince Dr. Harris to come to Thailand. He gets in the water with them. He swims the two and a half hours. He's like, I just got to get my eyes on these kids. I got to understand this situation. I got to see what we're up against in real time. He makes a two and a half hour dive. He sees the kids. He says, okay, we will be back. They swim away. He gets to the mouth of the cave. He comes out of the water and he's like, this is a terrible idea. But there is no other way. And they devise a plan. He comes up with a combination of drugs to sedate these kids, put an oxygen mask over their face. They tie their hands behind their back. They put them down face first, hoping that their airway will stay open to swim them out. And then the drugs that he came up with weren't going to last the full two and a half hours. So they recruited 14 other divers from all over the world to come and help them. He said, I had to give individuals who are not trained doctors and anesthesiologists drugs to administer halfway through the dive to keep these kids sedated so we could get them out hopefully alive. They were asking him questions like, is this going to be okay? Should I do this? He's like, yeah, it'll be fine. He says in a documentary, I was lying through my teeth. I had no idea how this was going to go. If you have Disney+, Plus, you can watch the documentary called The Rescue. It's amazing and it's fascinating. They do this. These kids, what they have to do to have any chance of living is to fully... Now, they're probably clueless to the magnitude of what's going on, but they had to surrender their life to the hands of these divers to sedate them, hoping that they were going to get out alive. Over the course of three days... They swam four kids out on day five. They swam four kids and one coach, totaling five, all out to safety. They all made it out alive. They thought for sure they would lose one, two, a couple of them, who knows. But they all made it out alive. All they had to do, not that it's that simple just to say all they had to do, but they had to put their confidence and their trust. They had to surrender their life to these men for a chance of life. And it's the same for us. If you find yourself in a cave where you feel trapped, helpless, and powerless, the invitation of Easter is to surrender your life to Jesus. Knowing that he will bring you to resurrection life. And then what that does is it gives you a sense of purpose. That your life has meaning, that it has purpose, that you were created for something more. There's design to which God has put in you, hardwired in you, for you to live according to his design and his purpose. When we just go and follow our own desire and just go after the things we want, we are breaking the purpose for God's design in our life. Do you guys remember the movie Little Mermaid, or the Disney movie Little Mermaid? Uh, Ariel, the mermaid, goes and swims throughout the ocean. She finds all of these treasures that are sunk from ships that have passed through her area. And then she brings them to the surface, and she has a friend named Scuttle. Scuttle's a seagull. And she brings these devices and these objects to Scuttle for him to explain to her what they are and how they're supposed to be used. One day, she brings a fork to Scuttle. She's like, what is this? How does this work? He pulls the fork from her. He goes, ah, this is a dingle hopper. This is the thing that humans use to style their hair. And he puts it in his hair, he twists it around, he pulls it out and goes, poof. Now, anybody who's watching that is like, this bird is an idiot, right? 
Because if one of my kids walked into the kitchen, opened up the utensil drawer, and pulled out a fork and started like styling their hair with it, I'd be like, hey, no, 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 that's not what you use a fork for. Because a fork has a designed purpose for it. It operates in a certain way. And when you break that purpose to try and style your hair, you're going to hurt yourself. It's going to become a tangled mess. You're going to stab yourself in the head. Because that's not what a fork was designed for. We have a purpose. We have a designed purpose in us for the way that God created us. And you're like, okay, well, what is it? What is that purpose? That's where Paul ends. He says in verse 10, For we are God's handiwork, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. You were created to do good, to do good in the world. And again, that also raises the same question, well, what does that mean? Like, do I volunteer at the school across the street, the nursing home down the road? Do I go collect leftover grocery carts in the parking lot that are left unattended and bring them back to the store to help out the clerks there? Like, what is the good work that I'm supposed to do? If you keep reading through Ephesians 2, from verse 11 on, Paul starts to talk about reconciliation, about reconciling the world to him that we are called to be witnesses, that we carry his love and his life, the resurrection power that raised Jesus from the dead, we carry that with us and we are called to go into the world and help and participate with God in reconciling the world to himself. And when you see that as your calling, you've been given your life back and God has a purpose for your life, to follow him, to serve him, to be a messenger for his good news in the world, it starts to change your desires. You end up wanting the things that God also wants. You want to see good in the world. You want to see people reconciled to God. You want to see people freed from addiction and slavery to sin. And it changes the way you look at everything in your life. It starts with acknowledging that, yes, I am dead And left to my own devices, desire unchecked leads to death. But it's also recognizing that God has given me life through his great love and mercy. He has made me alive through his death and resurrection. And now he is calling me to follow him, to surrender my full life to him and go with him into the world, to be an ambassador for the gospel, for the good news everywhere I go. So may you see that you, through Christ, have been made alive. And that this life that you have isn't just for yourself. But may you see that it's for a bigger purpose in bringing God's life and His love to a world that's desperately in need. Lord, we thank you so much for what you have done for us. For the salvation that you have secured for us. Lord, we recognize that we are undeserving. Like it says, we we don't deserve the love that you have lavished on us. We pray, Lord, that we would have a great awareness of the magnitude of your sacrifice, of the power of your resurrection, and that we would be inspired to follow you into the world, to be an agent of change and reconciliation to everyone we meet. Help us to live the greater purpose of your life and your love everywhere we go. Amen.